place we call our home is often associated with safety, comfort, and tranquility. Most people work their entire young lives to be able to afford a mortgage, start a family, and enjoy a life of comfort. Unfortunately, the American dream of the white picket fence doesn't always end with happiness. Sometimes our homes turn into an arena for a sinister game of cat and mouse, and even worse is when the very people that are expected to look out for our best interest end up causing the most damage. That's exactly what happened when these five individuals were attacked by their next door neighbors. Number 1 burning rain. The boiling water attack between Asia Wanamaker and Tony Booth occurred on October 6, 2010, when Asia and her sister Lachey attacked sisters Tony and Nia outside of their apartment in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Tony had recently moved into her apartment complex with her boyfriend and baby daughter Jayla. They meet Asia Wanamaker who ends up being their adjacent neighbor living directly across the hall from them, and the feud between the two officially begins one evening when Asia invites Tony to go out for a drink. Tony declines and returns to her apartment to tend to her child, and after seeing Asia leaving the complex, she begins to think about Asia's young daughter being left alone in the apartment. Tony goes over to double check on her, but unexpectedly, Asia's sister Lachey answers the door. The conversation between the two becomes awkward then hostile when Tony is reprimanded for thinking Asia would leave her daughter alone without any supervision. The hostility only builds when Tony and Lachey begin to coincidentally work for the same company, and Tony informs management that Lachey isn't following protocol when it comes to parking in the designated visitor's lot. Lachey is given a verbal warning at work and her involvement in the feud only progresses. Asia responds by allegedly smearing feces on Tony's front door. The immaturity is reciprocated when Tony invites her sister Nia over to pound repeatedly on Asia's door to prove that they can easily return the nights of disruption and intimidation. And Tony contacts management to take formal action against her neighbor, but with complaints coming from both sides and with no evidence to prove either right, Management can't evict either tenant. Next, Tony's daughter is allegedly shoved to the ground by Asia's daughter in the playground area of the apartment complex. Asia confronts Tony in the corridor of their apartments, and feeling threatened, Tony reaches for a can of mace in her purse and sprays Asia in the face when Asia attempts to back Tony into her own apartment to begin to physically brawl. The authorities are contacted, but the only physical evidence found is a cigarette butt belonging to Asia on Tony's apartment floor. Asia is given a citation by law enforcement, and now fearing for her sister's safety, Nia advises Tony to begin searching for a new apartment in a different complex. Unfortunately, the advice isn't taken to heart until it's too late. While Tony and her daughter are walking into the main entrance of the apartment complex, they unexpectedly run into Asia on her way to the grocery store. After a hostile stare down from Asia, Tony calls her sister Nia to come keep her company for the remainder of the day. Unbeknownst to Tony, Lachey is already upstairs in Asia's apartment, and internally Asia devises a plan and attack and exits the complex but re-enters from the back stairwell and calls Lachey to confront Tony before she reaches her unit. Tony and her daughter are stopped in the hallway by Lachey, and Asia now enters into the argument after picking up an extremely large pot of boiling water. Struggling with the additional weight of the spaghetti pot, she approaches her unsuspecting victim in the hallway. Tony notices Asia coming closer through peripheral vision, and in the blink of an eye, she pushes her daughter out of harm's way just before Asia throws the entire pot of boiling water onto Tony's face and body. Asia and Lachey then begin kicking and hitting a severely burnt Tony while she is incapacitated on the ground. With the very little strength she has left in her body, Tony grabs her daughter Jayla and goes down an entire flight of stairs to her neighbor's apartment. Tony quickly passes out in her friend's apartment shortly before Nia's arrival inside the complex. Both Asia and Lachey spot Nia running up the visible flight of stairs to Tony's apartment. Asia goes to grab a pot of hot water and allegedly mixes it with powder chemical cleaner and flings the water down Nia's path. Nia's face instantly becomes scorched and scaled as the boiling water permeates her skin. She blindly runs away from her attackers, and her screams attract the attention of her now-conscious sister. With both Nia and Tony unable to properly see due to their burnt eyelids, Tony runs into an injured Nia and begins mistakenly hitting her own sister. Both girls are jumped and attacked a third and final time by Asia and Lachey before police finally arrive to arrest the attackers. The sisters were rushed to the emergency room and were later transferred to a specialty hospital for burn victims. Nia was burned on her face, neck, shoulders, and arms with a severe loss of skin and pigmentation. Her skin was steaming and peeling rapidly when police arrived and found her wrestling on the ground with Asia. Tony sustained second and third degree burns and had to be hospitalized for at least a week following the attack. Without defense, Asia pleaded guilty to two counts of aggravated assault and two counts of conspiracy to commit aggravated assault. A jury convicted Lachey of two counts of aggravated assault and one count of criminal conspiracy to commit aggravated assault on Tony Booth. Asia was sentenced to 
to two and a half to five years in prison, and Lachey was sentenced to four years in prison for her involvement in the crime. Both Tony and Nia had several rounds of reconstructive surgery and skin grafts before making a full recovery from their attacks by their next door neighbors. Number two, toxic friends. Peggy Carr and her daughter were hard at work at a local restaurant when Peggy began feeling sick. She told her daughter she was afraid she was having a heart attack. She went home to rest, but her condition only worsened. She was taken to the hospital, but the ER physicians couldn't seem to find a diagnosis. They kept Peggy in the hospital for three days until her condition seemed to improve and then sent her home. By now, her son Dwayne and her stepson Travis had also started to complain about tingling fingers, upset stomachs, and burning sensations throughout their bodies. Days later, Peggy's symptoms returned and she was rushed to the hospital again. While she was being examined, one of her doctors noticed something troubling. Peggy's hair was beginning to fall out, and that's when doctors began to suspect that Peggy had been poisoned. They specifically suspected thallium, a tasteless, odorless chemical that was once widely used as an insecticide and rodent poison. Because of its extreme toxicity, ingesting as little as one gram can kill a full-grown adult. And thallium poisoning causes nerve damage that can feel like numbness, pins and needles, or fire coursing throughout the body. The doctors had Peggy's urine tested for thallium and the results came back a day later. They showed Peggy had 20,000 times the natural amount of thallium in her system. Dwayne and Travis were tested and their test results also came back positive. Though they eventually recovered, Dwayne was hospitalized for two months and Travis for six months. Since Peggy ingested such an enormous amount of the poison and hadn't been diagnosed until the thallium had been in her system for such a long time, her prognosis turned fatal. Getting weaker and in more pain by the day, she eventually lost her ability to speak and could only use sign language to communicate. Soon she slipped into a coma and on March 3rd, 1989, four long months after she had been poisoned, her family took her off life support and Peggy Carr died at the age of 41. Now, police suspected Peggy's husband, Pi, was responsible since he and Peggy had had recent marital problems and Pi was conveniently out of town when the family fell ill. But once test results revealed that he too was poisoned, as well as his son Travis, Pi was ruled out as a suspect. Police tested over 400 items in and around the home from the local well water to the trees and the orchids surrounding the property. They finally found traces of thallium and some empty Coca-Cola bottles in the home. This new evidence pointed to possible product tampering, which puts it under the jurisdiction of the FBI. And the FBI labs not only found thallium in the unopened Coke bottles, they also found microscopic tool marks indicating that the lids had been carefully taken off and then replaced. Since this was such a time-consuming and meticulous process, they concluded it couldn't have been done in a Coca-Cola plant or a grocery store. It had to have been done by someone in private after they purchased the drinks and took them home. Oddly enough, no one in the car household could remember buying those particular bottles of Coke. At first, Pi couldn't think of anyone who would want to poison Peggy. Then he remembered all the troubles he and his family had been having with the neighbors. His neighbors were George Trapel, a computer programmer, and his wife Diana, an orthopedic surgeon. Diana frequently complained about the noise coming from the car's home, their barking dog, loud music, and anything else she found annoying. Despite Diana's temper, most of the Carr family found George to be relatively nice, but apparently he was just as annoyed with his neighbors as his wife was. He just did a much better job of hiding it. In July 1988, Pi received an anonymous letter addressed to a misspelled Pi Carr. In it was a message typewritten on a post-it saying, you and your so-called family have two weeks to move out of Florida forever or else you all die. This is no joke. Pi shrugged it off as a prank and forgot about it. Then in October 1988, Diana went to the car's home in a rage. The family recalls that Diana was screaming, cursing, ranting, and raving about them playing their music too loud. They said her level of anger was way out of proportion to the situation. And when Peggy didn't submit to Diana's demands and instead walked away, they said Diana stormed off shouting, you won't get away with this and this isn't over. As Polk County Sheriff's detectives questioned neighbors about Peggy's poisoning, the quirky 42-year-old computer programmer George Trapel made several odd comments that gave authorities cause for concern. When asked by investigators why someone would want to poison his neighbors, Trapel said the poisoner must have wanted the cars to move away. His comment was eerily similar to the anonymous type note left at the car's home. Investigators dug deeper and they found George Trapel had spent two and a half years in a Connecticut prison in the 1970s for his role as a chemist in a methamphetamine lab. And thallium was a byproduct of producing methamphetamine before it was banned. Additionally, the car's family dog had also recently passed away after it mysteriously fell ill and began losing its hair shortly before Peggy's poisoning. In a brazen move from authorities, an undercover agent named Susan Gorick was assigned to befriend Trapel while posing as a member of his Mensa group. George and his wife often host murder mystery weekends and Susan was able to convince George to invite her to one of these events posing as Sherry. 
Only one month after Peggy's passing, the couple hosted a Mensa murder mystery weekend with some unsettling parallels to Peggy's poisoning. In the booklet she received from George written for the participants was a quote that read, When a death threat appears on the doorstep, prudent people throw out all their food and watch what they eat. Most items on the doorstep are just a neighbor's way of saying, I don't like you, move or else. In December 1989, Trapel rented his home to Susan after he and his wife were moving to Florida. Susan convinced George that she was running away from a fabricated abusive husband who worked as an attorney and was making her life a living hell. At one point, George suggested that Susan poison her fake husband to get what she wanted out of the divorce settlement. She also discovered that George made homemade wine and owned a tool that could recap bottles. And the day Trapel handed Susan the keys, officers scoured the house and searched for any possible evidence. The transaction worked out serendipitously for authorities. In a detached garage, they discovered a small bottle containing residue of thallium nitrate. Susan and George meet up to discuss the matter so that the evidence can continue to mount against him. George has no idea that his entire conversation is being recorded by authorities. Now that they have physical evidence tying George to the crime, police travel to Florida to arrest him, and a search of the house uncovered several poison and chemistry books and they also found a three-ring binder with the title General Poison Guide. And these copy pages included discussions on thallium and were all covered in George's fingerprints. In January 1991, George was charged with 15 criminal counts, including first-degree murder, attempted murder, poisoning food and water, and product tampering. Assistant State Attorney John Aguero rolled out four weeks of witnesses and evidence to a jury of eight men and four women. He described Trapel as a diabolical killer who perceived himself smarter than the police. The jury came back six hours later and found him guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to death on March 6, 1991, three days after the second anniversary of Peggy Carr's death. And according to a jury member, George was smirking as his verdict was being read out loud. Though he filed numerous appeals, George remains on death row to this very day for the murder of his 41-year-old next door neighbor. Number 3. Oven Roasted in a mobile home park the size of a typical city block, Brett Smith and William Perry became unexpected acquaintances who had recently just moved next door to one another. Living directly side by side meant interactions between the two inevitable, and the 41-year-old twice divorced Perry was now an ex-marine turned hairdresser who spent more than four years in a Florida prison and had been arrested at least five times before. A stark contrast to the slow-paced life of neighbor Brett Smith, who had never been married and spent most of his upbringing in the suburban Ohio area. This was the first time in his life that Brett was living alone and as a professional handyman, he was more than able to renovate his mobile home. After a couple of months of remodeling, friction develops between Brett and his neighbor William. A petty feud ensues when Brett's friend and neighbor Chris befriends William and ends up losing contact with Brett as a result of the newly formed friendship. One day, the two rivals engage in a brief physical altercation regarding piled up garbage from Brett's remodel. William ended up hitting Brett in the head with a wooden plank after their verbal exchange, and Brett's mother advises her son to move to a different neighborhood, but Brett has now become emotionally attached attached to his new home. William is dealing with stressors of his own when unpaid child support forces William to take a night job and he makes the rash decision to discontinue his bipolar medication. He does this in order to avoid brain fog during the time that he is awake, and it is during this same time period that Brett has his tires slash, his electric meter smashed, and his oil tank punctured. Everything culminates on the afternoon of October 3rd, 2008, when Brett plans to come over to visit his niece and have dinner at his mom's house. Later that same evening, William Perry is seen standing inside the doorway of Brett Smith's mobile home while a very heated argument takes place. Neighbors take notice as William was being much more aggressive than usual, and it turns out earlier that week, William's ex-wife had forbidden him to see their children until the neglected child support was paid. This ended up dismantling the final thread of William's mental health as he could no longer control his emotions and exploded on sight at the smallest altercation. Brett Smith never made it to his mother's home for dinner that evening, and Brett's mother calls him several times but receives only his outgoing voicemail. The next morning, Brett's mom Judy visits her son's home to check on him, and although his vehicle was in the driveway, no one answered the front door. While knocking, Judy noticed an unusual smoky odor billowing from her son's residence. Brett's mother leaves but returns to the residence again at around 6.30 p.m. in an additional attempt to contact Brett. Again, she receives no answer at the door and she continues to notice a smoking odor from earlier. Judy's anxiety persists, so she asks one of Brett's neighbors and former friends, Chris, to assist her in entering Brett's home. Chris uses a crowbar and successfully makes entry, and once inside, Judy notices a sticky substance as she's walking across the mobile home floor and spots a burning object inside the powered on oven. Upon walking further into the residence, she finds a headless body lying on the bathroom floor. Upon their arrival, police find the body of Brett Smith on the bathroom floor. His head, fingers, and thumbs had been cut off, and his body wrapped in plastic and covered with blue and white paint. 
Brett's severed head was found inside his own oven and was partially wrapped in burnt newspaper and cloth. The investigation by authorities revealed William Perry was inside of Brett's trailer the same day he was killed. They verified a pack of cigarettes on Brett's floor that matched the serial number on a pack William purchased earlier that week. However, the cigarettes and public verbal aggression isn't sufficient evidence to prove that William murdered Brett. Police needed more evidence or a witness to come forward. However, since William admitted to breaking Brett's electric meter, government-owned utility, he was arrested while awaiting trial for Brett's murder. Ten months after the murder, authorities got another break in evidence. A trash bag holding clothing, shoes, and other items stained with paint, bleach, and blood were found inside a home where William Perry once lived. And within hours of that discovery, Perry incriminated himself even further with letters he wrote from inside of jail. He admits the gruesome dismembering took a lot of effort to complete with the dull tools at his disposal. He severed Brett's head and tried to burn it in the oven to disguise his identity. He also severed off Brett's fingers and thumbs, possibly to conceal Brett's fingerprints for positive identification. He wrapped Brett's body in plastic and poured blue and white paint over the tarp and steals money out of Brett's wallet before leaving the scene of the crime. With this confession, there is no trial and William Perry pleads guilty to two counts of aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, aggravated burglary, gross abuse of a corpse, and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of his 34-year-old next-door neighbor. Number 4. Machete Man The phrase silence is golden is common knowledge when it comes to living in a shared space with neighbors above and below you. But what happens when you have a neighbor who can't even tolerate the smallest amount of music or barking in a crowded apartment complex? You're left with a ticking time bomb waiting to explode, and it all culminated one February morning when James Sven Gross hears screaming down the hall from his apartment. He quickly turns on his camera and points it intently at his front door. He knows how reckless and unpredictable his upstairs neighbor Twain Thomas is and wants documented evidence of his antics. Prior to this incident, Twain tried to break into James's apartment during New Year's Eve when loud music was playing from his unit. Twain tried to open the locked doorknob and then began banging on the door repeatedly. When the in-person banging doesn't work, Twain contacts the police to deal with James's noise. Now annoyed by Twain, James retaliates when authorities leave by turning his music up even louder than it was before. Twain is able to successfully break into James's apartment a second time while he is asleep. Twain grapples him to the ground and punches him in a series of manic strikes. Authorities arrived at the complex and interviewed both parties. Twain is cooperative with authorities and isn't arrested for assaulting James. Rather, James receives a citation for vandalizing Twain's vehicle in the presence of authorities. In response to the attack, James and his girlfriend Kayla purchase a handgun for their safety. Twain temporarily redirects his frustration towards his next-door neighbors Richard and Kelly. He confronts Kelly when she is alone in their apartment corridor to intimidate her into silencing her small dog. It seems that no matter how quiet his neighbors are, there is no level of compromise that satisfies him. Early one February morning, Twain receives notice in the mail that he will no longer be receiving disability benefits. The news causes a mental breakdown as James and his girlfriend are awoken by the sound of Twain breaking glass and wrecking various items in his own apartment. Then James hears Twain breaking into Richard and Kelly's apartment. What he can't see is that Twain is wielding a machete and ranting about their barking dog. In their only attempt at defense, Richard grabs one of his swords hung on the living room wall to ward off Twain. After a missed swipe at their dog, Twain comes to the realization that his actual target is his downstairs neighbor. Twain goes down a flight of stairs to reach James's apartment. James had already turned on the camera to capture the audio of the early morning disturbance to justify a formal noise complaint against Twain, not expecting to capture the horrific events that followed. Twain chops through the door using a machete. James shoots once, and with Twain still on his feet, he is forced to shoot him two more times. The camera is knocked off its stand as Twain passes the device, capturing only audio from this point on. Twain can be heard yelling on tape saying, You killed me. James responds by saying you were going to kill me. Twain blatantly admits, yes I was, and the statement caught on tape made the police investigation an open and shut case involving self-defense. How you kill me? What? You were going to kill me? Well, then I did the right thing. Twain Thomas's attorney told reporters that a neuropsychologist tested him and concluded that the 54-year-old suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder as well as brain damage from a car accident that occurred when he was a teenager. Blaming the incessant barking and loud music for his deteriorating mental condition, Twain Thomas pled guilty to attempted murder and aggravated assault of his neighbor and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Number 5. Red Eye in 2008, John Kendall was the first resident to move into the newly built Meadow Charm subdivision in the Green Meadows neighborhood in Washington State. 
Eric and Abigail Mounts moved next door to John in 2012. At first, all seemed amicable between neighbors, as John would always be willing to lend a helping hand. Over time, the strain between the neighbors begins, as John operates a vacuum repair business out of a shed in his backyard that causes loud noise and disruption at all hours of the night. The primary source of tension, however, between neighbors was John having as many as five tenants in his home, causing problems for the entire neighborhood. Because of the unprecedented amount of people from various backgrounds, many petty crimes and theft began to transpire in the formerly peaceful suburban subdivision. John felt as though the HOA rules that every tenant must abide by didn't apply to his property since he was under the grandfathered set of jurisdictions, which basically in his mind allowed him to do whatever he pleased. This grandfathered set of jurisdictions were later disproven to exist when a copy of the subdivision contract clearly stated that all residents, whether new or existing, must abide by the HOA and community bylaws. And the bylaws clearly prohibited having multiple tenants in your home and prohibited operating businesses out of any of the residential properties. The only problem is that the HOA refused to enforce the bylaws and told Eric and Abby that they had to deal with the problem on their own. The couple officially sued John Kendall in Washington Superior Court in March 2013 after he constructed an unsightly tarp structure for his backyard business. After months of constant complaints and bickering between the couple and neighbor, the authorities are finally contacted when John pulls out a black water gun and shoots Eric in the face with a fake pistol. Eric wanted to press charges but without physical evidence and with John spinning a different tale involving Eric trying to assault him, the feud continues to escalate. A different neighbor noticed a rifle case in the trunk of John Kendall's vehicle, but didn't think much of it since John Kendall was an avid hunter. But John was now also at odds with the entire community and would walk up and down the local neighborhood proudly displaying a handgun holstered on his waist. It all came to a violent head in the early morning hours of Halloween 2014 when John Kendall shot Abigail Mounts in the face and later shoots himself after leading police officers on a backwoods manhunt. John shot Abby at a traffic light right after the couple left for their scheduled court appearance. Before their departure, John was spotted by Eric running to his vehicle to catch up with the couple before arriving to the courthouse. Due to his failure to comply, it was well known that the judge was about to deliver a formal order demanding John evict his tenants and shut down his illegally operated business on his property. A demand that would financially bankrupt John and for him to move out of his home, and the ruling would also force him to pay $60,000 in fines to his neighbors for his negligence and defiance towards the HOA bylaws. After shooting Abby multiple times at the traffic light, John speeds off in his vehicle shortly before running into the woods. Eric, while in a state of shock, makes the call to 911 to report the shooting. Two hours later, John Kendall was located in the nearby woods and found unresponsive by police dogs. The 59-year-old man had taken his own life shortly after shooting his 33-year-old neighbor point-blank in the face. Of all of Abigail's injuries, the most critical were the bullet that struck the right side of her face and resulted in the loss of her right eye. She also underwent reconstructive surgery on her cheek, as well as undergoing an ocular prosthesis to have her right eye replaced in 2015. Investigators told the couple that they recovered a total of 17 shell casings at the scene, meaning John shot a total of 17 rounds into the couple's vehicle. Miraculously, Eric escaped unharmed and was able to rush his wife to the hospital just in time to begin life-saving measures. Abigail has now made a complete recovery after being attacked on that Halloween morning.